I have here a pendulum. I have an object that weighs 15 kilograms, and I can lift it up one meter, which I have done now. If I would let it swing from one meter height, and you would be there and it would hit you, you'd be dead. 150 joules is enough to kill you. You let it go, you swing it, thereby converting gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy, and that way you can demolish a building. You just let it hit, and it breaks a building. And that's the whole idea of wrecking. So you are using, then, the conversion of gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy. Now, I am such a strong believer of the conservation of mechanical energy that I am willing to put my life on the line. I trust the conservation of mechanical energy for 100 percent. I may not trust myself. I'm going to release this object, and I hope I will be able to do it at zero speed, so that when it comes back, it may touch my chin, but it may not crush my chin. I want you to be extremely quiet, because this is no joke. If I don't succeed in giving it zero speed, then this will be my last lecture. <laughs> I will close my eyes. I don't want to see this. So please be very quiet. I almost didn't sleep all night. Three, two, one, zero. Physics works, and I'm still alive. <laughs> See you Wednesday. Welcome to lecture four of Fundamental Mechanics lecture series. Today we'll learn about the conservation of energy, one of the most applied principles in all science. In the previous lectures, we we'll learned about the kinetic energy and briefly discussed about the thermal energy, mainly in the form of friction. Before we delve into the conservation of energy, we must first discuss another category of energy called potential energy. Potential energy is, as the name suggests, a type of energy that can be stored up in the system's reservoir. The most common examples of a potential energy would be the gravitational potential energy. A mass of water stored up in a dam possesses a tremendous amount of potential energy. Now, there is a condition um, to be fulfilled for this massive potential energy to be discharged, which we will learn in today's lecture. Now, we know about the gravitational force, that is the force of F sub G, that we usually write, that is equal to mg the mass times the gravitational acceleration that the planet Earth exerts on those who are at the surface level of that planet. Now, the gravitational potential energy is denoted as a U sub G that is written as mg multiplied by y. And here, y is the height. Now, this y height is, of course, relative to where one sets the zero baseline to be. The height of the water stored up in a dam could be measured from the bottom of the dam or from the bottom of a town, which may be located even lower than the dam. Hence, the UG, the, poten the gravitational potential energy, is, is, is more relevant to discuss. Um, in terms of a change in potential energy, i.e. change in height. The gravitational potential energy, the change of gravitational energy is mg delta y. And it is this change in height that unleashes the gravitational potential energy in proportion. Nothing happens with the massive volume of water when it simply sits inside a dam. However, when there is a discharge, or God forbid, a breach in the dam, then proportional to the change in height, this potential energy could have a devastating impact. 
Another type of potential energy that we already encountered is elastic potential energy, i.e. spring potential energy. Now, as you can see from this expression here, unlike the work or the force of the spring, the, the elastic potential energy, it doesn't matter whether the spring is compressed or stretched in terms of its energy quantity, because here the notation is simply uh, delta S with no subscript and it's squared. So there is no sign, there is no directionality in terms of it. It simply uh, gives you that the energy quantity that is stored up in a spring, whether it's compressed or it's stretched. Now we will go over some examples towards the end using these energy expressions to solve problems. Now that we have um, learned about the potential energy, let's go back and learn about the conservation of, of energy. Now, take a look at the figure on the right-hand side here. Now, we're going to assume that the system has a certain boundaries. Now, inside of these boundaries, there is no external influences that, that, that interacts with what is inside of the system. Okay, so we will consider the system to be isolated. And then we're going to generalize all known energies into three basic categories. Number one is the kinetic energy. All forms of energy with a moving body uh, uh, with a mass attached to it. So kinetic energy, one half mv square. Anything that has a mass and a moving velocity will exhibit a kinetic energy. Then you have a potential energy U, which, it ha for example, the gravitational potential energy, elastic potential energy, electric potential energy, there are many kinds of different potential energy that could be categorized as U. The third category is a thermal energy. Now this we have briefly discussed in the context of friction. Friction that um, dissipates the system energy into a heat energy. Um, so anything that has to do with the friction, drag, and that changes into heat will be categorized as a thermal energy. Now out of this three, now this is, now here is what conservation energy states. The conservation energy states that the total energy that is isolated from the surrounding has a component of mechanical energy plus a thermal energy. Now here I have to define the mechanical energy. The mechanical energy is simply the sum of all kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So in this figure, the top two ones make up the mechanical energy and then the thermal energy. So the total energy of the system is the mechanical energy plus the thermal energy. Now, the conservation energy then states that the total energy inside of the isolated system remains constant. So what does that mean? That means there is no change. The, they merely changes, it transform into different forms of energy, but the total amount of energy in the system will remain constant. So from this very principle, let's, uh, let's work on some mathematical derivation to see if we could um, um, have some e useful expressions. So what does it mean that the total energy of the system remains constant? Um, that means the change of energy total will be simply equal to zero. And that you can write in terms of change in mechanical energy plus change in thermal energy will be equal to zero. This, in a little bit more detail, is of course change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy plus change in thermal energy is equal to zero. Now what does, what does change in kinetic energy mean? Well, we can write this that the final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy plus final potential energy minus initial potential energy plus delta E thermal will remain to be zero. I'm here just rewriting the expressions that discuss above. 
Um, here, let's send all our initial terms to the, outs uh, to the other side of the equations. So here, I can write final kinetic energy plus final potential energy plus delta E thermal is equal to initial kinetic energy plus initial potential energy. And now the, the textbook um, and also um, for, for our, our logical thinking pattern, just, just thinking from uh, reading from left to right, I'm just going to change the order between here. So I'll have the initial kinetic energy plus initial potential energy is finally equal to the final kinetic energy, final U plus E thermal. This form is another expression of the of the uh, conservation of energy that we can uh, we can uh, uh, apply this in different patterns. Here I have highlighted the, just the first um, portion except the thermal energy. This is the mechanical energy portion of the conservation of energy. And what you actually will do is you compare the initial to mechanical total mechanical energy, and then you set that equal to uh, the final. A mechanical energy and those two things should be equal to one another and I will show you examples how you can utilize this simple but very powerful tools to solve um, a, a seemingly complicated problems now to make them more general we also have the the change in thermal energy here let's think about what this means here let's say your initial total mechanical energy was 100 and that means certain events take place and energy transfers takes place. It doesn't matter um, if there is no friction involved. Your initial state compared to the final state, the, the sum of kinetic plus potential will remain 100 equal. But now if you consider a, a um, thermal energy, this would be, you will have perhaps 90 is divided among, between the final state of the mechanical energy plus thermal energy. This is the portion 10 that is dissipated as heat. So you will have less either kinetic energy uh, or the potential energy because you, you have to divide it among the, the thermal energy and the final of mechanical energy. So, for example, you have you've given uh, you're going into a uh, um, a path with 50 meters per second velocity, and then after traveling a certain distance, if there's no friction, you know that you'll still be uh, cruising with the same amount of velocity. But because of the friction that dissipates a part portion of the initial uh, energy, you will have slower velocity. And what you have lost is in terms of the uh, delta E thermal, the change in thermal energy, that you cannot uh, uh, restore back into your mechanical energy. So take a look at this expression here um, in, in, in conjunction with the figure that figure here. I would like to point out here the arrow between K and U is, is, uh, uh, is vice versa. It means that there is a transformation that can take, take place from kinetic energy into potential energy and vice versa. It's bidirectional. However, you notice here the arrows going from kinetic energy to thermal energy, potential to thermal energy is one way street. And that is because we cannot efficiently um, turn back or, or restore back what is lost to, to thermal energy back into kinetic or potential energy. The law of thermal thermodynamics, the law of entropy, uh, sort of dictates this, which is um, related, but outside of, the, um, of, this, of this lecture series. But it simply prohibits the thermal energy to go back in an efficient way, in a meaningful way, back to the kinetic or potential energy. So what is lost through friction is lost. You cannot retrieve it back as your kinetic or potential energy. Which means, um, 
let's let me draw a representation here. Let's say you have kinetic energy and here you have potential energy and there was uh, no thermal energy. After processes of transformation between kinetic energy and potential energy, you will have less and less and less kinetic energy left and potential energy left, but you have more and more and more energy that is lost in terms of thermal energy. And this is this is consistent with our daily experience, which in the conservation of energy is also a consistent result that we can, we can predict. Another interesting thing is, um, consider here in our derivation that the change in kinetic energy plus the change of potential energy remains zero. Meaning that if there is a greater kinetic energy that takes place, then the change of potential energy will compensate for it, such that it is a zero-sum game. If a certain energy, kinetic energy, has been converted into potential energy, then you will have the kinetic energy portion to be, remain small, and then you have a larger portion for the potential. And when it goes back the other way, you have small potential energy, but large kinetic energy, and the sum of that in between will remain constant. Meaning that it's, it's kind of a zero-sum game. And to demonstrate this, uh, let me show you this uh, simulation. So in this energy skate park, now you notice, let me stop him for a second. Um, you see him here, the zero baseline is here. So his momentary potential energy is approximately six meters above zero. Multiply times um, his weight and 9.8. And you can see that also in the bar graph that most of his, the total energy is this, most of the energy is in the form of potential energy and that's because he hasn't quite reached the top. Let's stop him almost at the top on the other side here. Now, most of his energy is in the potential energy. Now, take a look at how this bar graph between kinetic energy and potential energy uh, swings back and forth. As the skater is traveling back and forth of this uh, W-shaped uh, loop, you can see the kinetic energy and the potential energies are, are taking turns. Now, the summation of the kinetic energy and potential energy and the thermal energy re is a total energy which remains the same. This is the conservation of energy. The total energy in a system and this here that what you see is the total energy, the total system that is isolated from the uh, external influences. And here you can see that if one gains a kinetic energy the potential energy portion must decrease like a zero-sum game, like a zero-sum pie. Now, hopefully, these concepts of conservation of energy is making sense to you. And now, the, the second part, we're going to actually solve some problems to demonstrate these points. So, problem solving in example 10.3, um, we're, we're, we're finding the speed of a sled. The Christine runs forward with her sled at 2.0 meters per second. She hops onto the sled at the top of a 5 meter high, very slippery slope. And this means that it was, is, there's no zero friction. What is her speed at the bottom? Now, we're going to solve several examples using only the conservation of energy. And hopefully I could demonstrate to you how useful this concept is. Let's write it up here of our conservation of energy statement. It is the sum of the initial mechanical energy that is equal to the sum of final mechanical energy plus, if it's applicable, delta thermal energy. Now in this case, there is no friction. There is no... Um, there's no thermal energy being involved in this example. And uh, let's draw out a situation here. She is sitting on top here. 
Now, we're not even given the, uh, the angle here because it's not necessary. We're told that this is five meters high and this is frictionless. Now, her initial speed we're given is 2.0 meters per second. And we're asked, what is her speed at the bottom? Well, simply, let's consider this statement above here. What is the sum of her kinetic plus the, the uh, uh, potential energy? Well, her initial kinetic energy is one half mv initial square. And what was what is her initial potential energy? Well, is mg times her height. Then. When she gets to the bottom, we have measured five meters from the zero basis line. So she will not have any potential energy left, but that portion of potential energy will be all converted into her kinetic energy. So here simply she will have mv final square plus zero. And there's no friction involved, so there's no loss. So, Okay, so in this example, maybe I have cut it that there's no uh, mass given, but it's really irrelevant. But if, because if you can see it here, you have mass in all these expressions. So you can simply can cancel out the mass. It turns out that mass doesn't even really matter in this to solve this problem. So I'm going to cancel out the mass from here. And simply what you have is initial velocity square divided by 2 plus g multiplied by 5 is equal to final velocity by 2. We know that the initial velocity is 2, so, so 2 squared is 4 over 2 plus 9.8, 5, and then you're solving it for the final velocity. This is the rest of them is just simple arithmetic, so I will leave that up to, leave that to you to, to find the, the final answer. All right, so that was a very straightforward example of applying um, the case. Let's try this example. Example 10.4. Here, during the skateboard finals, Isabella encounters a 6 meters long, 15 degree upward ramp. Isabella's mass, including the skateboard, is 55 kilogram. Okay, the slope is 15 degree. And the coefficient rolling friction between her wheels and the ramp is 0.25. With what speed must she start up the ramp to reach the top at 2.5 meters per second? And what percentage of her mechanical energy is lost to friction? All right, so there are um, more than one element being involved here. Let's break it down step by step. But the, the principle we are going to apply is, remains the same. Just write it out here, initial, initial, final, final, delta, e-thermal. Every problem that you encounter in chapter 10 or problems that's dealing with conservation of energy will not escape the scope of using this expression above. So once you're, once you're used to how to utilize these equations up here, you will be able to solve any problem that you encounter regarding conservation of energy. So let's consider, she is starting at the bottom here, at the zero. So we are going to say that her initial potential energy is zero, okay? Now, we are asked what would be her initial velocity that she needs to start up. And her initial potential energy is zero. Her final potential energy that she hopes to achieve is 2.5 meters per second square. And then her final uh, potential energy plus how much thermal energy goes to uh, friction. Now, of course, as we learned before, here the change in her thermal energy will be all due to the uh, uh, due, due to friction force. Now, if we have to do a little bit of geometry here. We're given that this slope is 15 
degree. And the diagonal of here is six meters. This means that if you take, if, if you want to solve it here, we have to apply sine 15 will be y divided by 6. So our height y is 6 times sine 15, which is the expression that you see here, which is 1.55 meters. Now, the, the diagonal length still remains valid, valid because we have to solve um, for the... Uh, um, um, I'm sorry, here you have to multiply the displacement here, okay, um, uh, for the uh, uh, energy loss due to the uh, um, friction here. All right, so let's go back here. Let's simplify here. One half, we have 55, and we're solving for initial velocity. Here we have one half, 55, 2.5 square. And here we know her final potential energy would be 55 times 9.8 times the y, 1.55 meter that we have solved over here, plus the thermal energy. Okay, so here this is, oh, let me, I'm sorry about this, let me just write it once again here. This is friction force times the displacement. Okay, and here you have a, a mu normal force R. Okay, and here, if you remember in an inclined situation, the normal force is not simply mg, the normal force is mg cosine theta delta R. So here, you will have um, mu mg cosine theta dot delta r, which, which again, let me, let me directly write here, is 0 0.025 55 9.8 cosine 50, 15 times the length of the diagonal that she actually travels upward, that is 6.0 meter. So from this, I can see that there is mass multiplied to, to every single component. So the mass simply cancels out here. And let me multiply everything by two. So to get rid of half here, square is equal to 2.5 square plus 2, 9.8, 1.55, plus 2, 2, 5, 9.8, cosine 15, times 6. And V initial will be the square root of the entire right-hand side expression here. I will leave to you also to find the final answers on this one. Let me just recap how you solve this problem again. Here in this situation, we're given that the, the, the skate of uh, Isabella is traveling with a certain initial velocity from the bottom of the ramp. That means she will have initial kinetic energy and her initial potential, gravitational potential energy will be zero. The final stage, you only compare the initial to the final. Final stage, she has a final kinetic energy that is one half mv square. And their final velocity that she wants to achieve is 2.5 meters per second. That means her initial velocity must be, must be greater than the final. Now, then the portion that the decreased amount of uh, kinetic energy, the change in kinetic energy, went into increasing the potential energy from zero to mg height, how, how high that she got up there. 
but there was a friction that were involved. So the friction is going to dissipate some of the initial portion of her, her mechanical energy away from the final state. And that is due to the friction, which is uh, delta E thermal for friction is friction force times the, the displacement. And in this case, the friction force, as you know, is mu, uh, mu times normal force. In normal force, an inclined plane is mg cosine theta. That is along her moving path on diagonally. So you simply multiply the uh, uh, di diagonal lengths of six. Putting that all together, using the expression that you see, the conservation of energy, you're able to find her velocity. Let me continue a couple more examples to, to solidify this. This time, this is, is, is one of your homework problems, actually, um, with slightly different number, numbering. As a 15,000 kilogram jet plane lands on an aircraft carrier, its tail hook snags a cable to slow it down. The cable is attached to a spring with a spring constant 60,000 newtons per meter. If the spring stretches 30 meters to stop the plane, what was the plane's landing speed? All right, so again, I'm just going to write here the conservation of energy principle. And here, there is no friction involved, so this, we're only talking about the mechanical uh, energy portion. All right, so initially, the jet plane approached landing on this carrier with initial velocity like this. Now, in this case, the potential energy is the spring elastic potential energy and not the gravitational potential energy that is concerned here. So, in the beginning, the, the, uh, before it hits a spring, uh, there is no initial elastic potential energy, so it is equal to zero. Here in the final, we want the jet plane to stop. So her final velocity will be equal to zero. So the final kinetic energy is zero. But all of that energy went into elastic potential energy. So you have simply a situation where the kinetic energy, initial kinetic energy is equal to final elastic potential energy. One half goes away, and we're solving for initial velocity here, k divided by m, delta s squared. So take the square root of that, you will have k m multiplied by delta s. And since here our mass is 15,000, and k is 60,000, and uh, spring stretches 30 meters, so delta S is 30 meters, is simply just plug it in here. Square root of this is actually 4 divided by 4, where K divided by M multiply 30, which is 2 times 30. So the initial landing speed was 60 meters per second. Okay, remember, you're just going to compare the initial and the final. Initial and final, if there is a friction involved, you have the plus uh, delta E theta. That's all you need to have. That's all you need to get used to to, to solve. You'd be surprised how many problems you can solve applying the conservation of energy. Now, to finish it off, let's return back to the brave demonstration that Professor um, Dr. Walter Lewin has, uh, has done in, uh, from MIT uh, during his uh, physics uh, lecture. Now, we're going to take a look at this, the pendulum model here. The example 10.7. A pendulum is created by attaching one end of a 78 centimeter long string to the ceiling and tying a 150 gram steel ball to the other end. The ball is pulled back until the string is 60 degrees from the vertical, then released what is the speed of the ball at its lowest point? Okay, so <clears throat> a ball is attached by a, by a string to the ceiling, as we have seen in the video and during the introduction of this lecture. 
and then when it's released, having 60 degrees from vertical angle, it's going to reach its maximum velocity when it hits the lowest point. And then given that there is no energy loss, this will stop on the other side also at 60 degrees from the vertical angle. And given that there is no dissipative energy here, this transform, transformation between kinetics and potential will go, go on back and forth and back and forth. And this is a simple pendulum model. So let's, let's calculate this. Again, I'm going to write here Ki plus Ui is equal to Kf plus Uf. Every time you, you think that you're dealing with a conservation of energy problem, just write them down. And it will make your life very much easy um, to simply writing these principles down. All right, but we have to do some geometry to figure, figure certain, certain things out. So take a look at the figure on the right-hand side. The basic information is written here. Um, now, with the ball is going to have the lowest height in the middle. And let's call that our baseline here. Here, all of the energy, mechanical energy, is in terms of kinetic energy because the height is zero here, the potential energy is zero. Everything is in terms of kinetic energy. When the ball will stop on the other side here, or in the beginning here, because the pendulum is at rest momentarily, all of the mechanical energy is in terms of potential energy. Okay? Now, then that means we have to figure out the length, the, the height difference from zero to here. So take a look at this figure here. Uh, when it's stretched out 60 degrees, which is initial um, height, what would be th the difference between here? Y0 minus Y1. Well, we know the length of this doesn't change. The length we're given is 78 centimeters, a 0.78 meters here. From vertically stretch of 60. Now, we need to know here. And as you can see from this triangle, this is L, and that is 60 here, and here's a 90 degree. This side would be the cosine portion, right? The cosine 60 degree is L, and then you have this base that you want to find. So that's why the base here is called L cosine 60 here. But we're not done yet. Because when, when the, uh, the pendulum is at the lowest point here, now this entire length here is L. Can you see it? So the height difference from this point to the lowest point will become L minus L cosine 60. Again, because this portion here, when it's stretched to its maximum angle out, is L cosine 60. At the lowest point, the height difference from here to zero baseline is L minus this height, which is L minus L cosine 60. And that's everything that we need to know about. So we'll go back to the conservation of energy here. Now, initial, initially, Everything was in potential energy, so there is no kinetic energy. So you have only have initial, which is mg, I will call that, and here the height is L minus L cosine 60. And that length is what we found out here. When the ball is at the midpoint, the lowest point, there is no potential energy anymore because it hits the baseline zero where we set it. Everything is in terms of kinetic energy, so you write one half mv square. Mass cancels out again, and we have L cosine 60 multiplied by 2 is velocity square. This is 2, 9.8. And this one is 
0.78 minus 0.78 cosine 60. That is equal to velocity square. And again, the rest, rest, the, the rest of the um, problem remains as arithmetic details. So I'll leave that up, lead up to you to finish off this problem. Now this concludes our lecture series today. Thank you for watching and thank you for your attention. And remember that the gravitational potential energy is relevant in terms of change in height. This change in height unleashes the massive, massive amount of stored up energy um, potentially having a devastating impact. And stay safe out there and see you next time. Yeah.